That's awesome. And also, thank you online as well. I'm trying to make eye contact with everybody. I think that's, it's important to say thank you. And then second, I'd like to, to point out, you know, there's a lot of moving parts, a lot of things that take place for this to happen. You know, and there's always some unsung hero or somebody in the background that really pushes forward the process to make it gel, to make it come together. And, and for me, that unsung hero is Miss Judy. And, and ma'am, if you're out there listening right now, and I don't think you are, but still, when you watch this later on on YouTube, thank you very much. Truly, she, she's an inspiration to me. Not only a friend, but an inspiration. Somebody that can organize things and keep the process moving forward. That's a pretty important part of our business, too. And I'd also like to thank the University of Texas at Arlington, OSHA, and the CSLA, the, the Construction Safety Leadership Alliance, for putting this on, it's a joint venture. 
And I want to talk a little bit about the CSLA. You know, this is a grassroots movement, a group of like-minded professionals that got together to try to make a difference in construction here in the DFW area. And that, it's still, it's still in its infancy stage, but we want to push this thing forward. And so it doesn't cost any money to join. All we ask is that you come and just check, check your title at the door, be polite, be part of the process, engage with us. Safety's a verb. It's, it's something we do. It's not something we just sit and soak in. It's something we learn and present not only to our, our, our coworkers, and my family as well. I truly, keeping my family safe is number one, and I'm sure it's the same with all of you too. So a, a little bit about the CSLA, and, and the, the third Tuesday of every month, normally we meet at 11.30 over there off of Mitchell. This, you're thinking this is a sales pitch, and you're absolutely right, it is. But uh, <laughs> Dr. Knight, we love the more the merrier, because truly, iron sharpens iron. It's very biblical, and I truly believe in that concept. And I'm asking each and every one of you to come out when you can to be part of the, the, the process. And then last, why a, a safety stand down? You know, and I thought about this a little bit. Why a safety stand down a week after the national safety stand down? Are we a little bit behind schedule here? You know it and no. No, we're not. The safety stand down is not over. It's just started. You know what, we have a moral obligation each and every day to do everything we can to give everybody on our crews the same opportunity to make it home. You know what, I, I, I want to see my wife, my children, my mother, my father, and we got to give that same opportunity to our people. That's why the safety stand down didn't end last Friday at 5.30 when we knocked off and went home. It just started. This is an ongoing or continuing process that we need to do to set the example, to set the bar as high as we can so again, everybody goes home. That's, that's why we're having this stand down today. As a reminder, each and every day, we, we need to remind our people, we need to be reminded of what's important. You know, anybody can build a job, anybody for me. We can, lots of guys out there, Mike Barefoot, uh, a highway construction and auto repair shop can build a highway, but not safely. We, this is where it comes together right here. And I hope that you uh, take this to heart, learn something, and share it. Share it not only with your coworkers, but again, I say take it grassroots, all the way down to your family, your family, your neighbors, your city, the region, the state, the nation. Uh, I had a, a really good friend of mine sitting over there in that beautiful jacket tell me once that we can make a difference, one drop at a time in a clear pond. We make a difference. That one ripple, the people around us see this excellence that we're doing and they want to make a difference. And they have a ripple. And the people around them, and the next thing you know, this ripple effect takes place. And that one person did make a difference. And that's what this is about today. And I thank you very much. And I'm going to admit, uh, uh, invite Mr. Doug Huddleston with OSHA to come up and kick this off in earnest. And we'll, uh, we'll get going on this learning process together, or this journey together. Thank you very much. Everybody hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, good. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. Um, Today, just want to thank you all for being here. Um, Mike is right. Um, that's a good, good thought. Why can't every day, every week be fall stand down? We just uh, came from a week of stand downs. Uh, many of you we saw on job sites. Um, but again, uh, thinking about it, uh, what what my, Mr. Barefoot was talking about, taking it to the grassroots. By you coming here today and you viewing this uh, video. Uh, we hope that you take it on down to like what Mike said, the grassroots level. That's important. 
Um, this morning, uh, I'm Doug Huddleston from the OSHA Region 6 office in Dallas, Texas. We're going to talk about a few things, talk about uh, some overview of facts, uh, look at some injuries, statistics, uh, some of the top 10 violations, and some initiatives. Um, go ahead and kick it off. Talking about uh, the facts on the fall. So, as it says there, uh, falls are the leading cause of death. Um, we look at statistics. Falls tend to be a very large statistic. In this case, uh, 350 of total fall, uh, fall related or fall related fatality uh, events and accidents. Uh, one in three, uh, typically one in three of the fatal falls. Uh, involve elevations or uh, you know less than 15 feet um, that tells you something um, you know I read that statistic last week uh, to, to groups uh, that should mean something when you hear that uh, you know someone can fall from 100 feet 200 feet but when you can actually fall from a, a height of 15 feet or less uh, that kind of demonstrates how how what we're talking about here today um, one in four falls involve a uh, fall from a ladder. Uh, what kind of ladders? Uh, that, are they 40 foot extension ladders? The answer is no. Uh, it can be 6 foot, 10 foot, 12 foot uh, a ladder. Uh, so, uh, but that's from our Bureau of Lab Labor Statistics in 2015 data. <clears throat> Talking about nationwide fall uh, uh, fatalities uh, throughout. Um, Work-related, we're looking at, you know, from years 2011 uh, all the way up to 2016. Uh, there were 738 uh, total falls, uh, total uh, fatalities, and then up into 2016, 991. You can see an increase. The percentage uh, also increases exponentially uh, from 35% uh, up to 37. So falls remain constant, and that's why we're here today. Uh, and we hope that you know you can help us out, get the word out. Uh, that's what we're talking about: reducing some of these uh, fatal workplace accident uh, statistics. Construction in Texas overall. <clears throat> talking about amputations. One of them you may not hear much about. Uh, some of you that are safety folks out there, uh, most definitely, 56 amputations uh, in 2017 and 41 uh, amputations in 2018. Talking about hospitalizations, uh, fiscal year 2017, we have 318 hospitalizations, uh, and then 2018, 185 hospitalizations. Of course, each one of those statistics has something tied to it. Uh, it's important, that's why we're talking about it. Uh, when you go out and you speak at your job sites and you talk about safety or uh, you know, root cause analysis, you talk about job hazard analysis, you take a look at these, uh, they're kind of related and, uh, and all that. Construction fatalities in Texas, we have caught in between, all the way down to uh, struck by. You can see highlighted in red, uh, on the screen, we have a total of 28 falls in Texas. That's for 2017. Uh, as of <clears throat> present day from uh, October 2017 to 2018, we have a total of 20. Uh, unfortunately, those are increasing day by day and every day. Uh, <clears throat> some of the ones that we take a look at, uh, you know, struck by, uh, caught in between. Uh, but you can kind of see there where things uh, fall together. Falls are a ma uh, leading uh, major issue that we have in construction fatalities. Fatal four. So uh, you'll hear the words fatal four used. Uh, they're responsible for more than half of the total fatalities. Talking about falls, uh, of course, struck by, uh, electrocution, and caught in between. Estimating that a total, uh, the fatal four, uh, if we could just eliminate those fatal four, would save uh, hundreds if not thousands of lives uh, every year. Talking about OSHA's top ten, so you can see some of the, uh, you know, the OSHA um, regulations with it, fall protection, general requirements. Um, if you've worked longer than one day on a job site, you know that 
there can be issues with fall protection. There can be training issues. Uh, if you go down to number 10, fall protection systems criteria. And today, we've got some good folks that are going to talk about some systems, talk about, uh, you know, that would help you maybe uh, help reduce or eliminate those falls. Of course, on our safety end, we definitely want to be talking out there on the front line, talking about ways and means of us reducing those falls, using that equipment, um, and, and including that in daily safety groups. The ladder, as you can see, <clears throat> under the 1926, 1053, uh, that is one that a statistic that I read earlier, and most definitely, that's one that uh, sometimes gets overlooked. Um, you're, you're trying to work on something that's, uh, you know, at the 20-foot level, you've got a 12-foot ladder uh, standing on the top rung of the ladder. It can be just that. Uh, we have a lot of incidents that occur that way. So ladder usage, and I believe they're going to talk about that today. Uh, all the way down to aerial lifts. Uh, we've got some good displays, uh, type things out uh, that we may be able to take a look at later. Uh, and we'll look at some... Uh, you know, our good folks will come and talk to you about safety in the aerial woods and fall protection. Silica standard. So, uh, you know, it, OSHA has issued uh, the update uh, that we have. OSHA issued the two new respir uh, chrys crystalline silica standards. Um, construction, the enforcement began September 23rd of 2017. Uh, general history and maritime enforcement will begin June 23rd, 2018, so that's coming up. Uh, silica has been a big issue. Um, we, we appreciate uh, all the efforts of industry and, and, you, and you folks out there getting behind that, and we're talking about silica more and more. Safe and sound. <clears throat> um, what is safe and sound day? Uh, that's coming up in the August time frame, you can see on the screen. Uh, Safe and Sound is an event that we started back in 2016. Uh, it continues to grow. And what is Safe and Sound? Well, Safe and Sound is talking about taking five, ten minutes of your day to your group, to your company, and talking to them about safety and health programs, how to improve that. Um, how do I engage or how do I support that? Uh, during that week, uh, you can do things such as talking to your groups, breaking them down into groups, much like we do during fall standout. Um, you can invite OSHA uh, to come out and talk about uh, safe and sound. The key thing is, you know, with safe and sound, uh, a, a lot of us think about, you know, larger contractors, uh, safety and health programs, but what about those uh, subcontractors that work for the larger contractors? Those are the people that we're trying to reach. In CSLA, uh, has been instrumental and will be, uh, we believe, and going forward and talking about that. Like Mr. Barefoot said, it's a drop in the pond right now, but when you get out there and you start talking about safe and sound, talking about these uh, initiatives, then we can begin to make headway. Heat stress campaign. So uh, we're here in Texas today in Arlington, Texas, in this beautiful facility, but outside in about five or 10 days, to two weeks, we're going to be in 100 degree plus heat. Uh, you may be viewing this video in another state at some point. Uh, you may have heat issues. Uh, our southern states get really warm and the temperatures go above 100 degrees. We were out, uh, I was out with Mr. Barefoot, we were doing the fall stand down at one of his job sites. It was already starting to get warm out there. So, what is water rest shade? It talks about some statistics. In 2016, 39 workers died from heat exposure. Uh, 220 since 2011. Talking about 4,110 workers were injured. What is a heat injury? It could be various means and measures, symptoms, there's things to look for. We need to be talking to our groups and our safety meetings about uh, reducing those heat illnesses. You're only a step away when you have a heat illness. You may be a step away from heat stroke. Uh, on the tarmac, out on the concrete, wearing fall protection, hard hat equipment. Uh, you're already stressed, you need to be aware of that. And that's what kind of what we're talking about in a heat stress campaign. Uh, acclimate, that's the key thing. 
You don't just go out and start working in 100 degree heat. Uh, you kind of work up to it. And you make sure you hydrate. Talking about uh, our big event, which is coming up in 2018, the uh, end of in September, around the 12th. We're going to have the Construction Safety and Health Conference down in Houston, Texas. And I will tell you, we had our first conference. The first one was held in Irving, Texas. We had a really good turnout. But this is one that we really, you can see it there on, this, on the screen. Uh, there is a website to, turn, to uh, register. This is going to be a good event. We're going to have some, uh, we're scheduling some keynote speakers, and we're going to have some really good sessions. But we need your help in getting the word out. Why do we do this? Why do we have CSLA? For no other reason, we do these events just to get the word out. And you're a big part of that. If you're listening to me today, you're viewing the video, please uh, consider this. It's going to be a really good event. We appreciate your participation. That's all I have today. And um, I just want to thank uh, UTA, Oceanic Center. I want to thank CSLA for having us here. Uh, we want to thank Mike Barefoot and, and all the people that participated. I believe I will be followed by Mr. Luciano's case. Mr. Luciano. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is going to be very brief. This is a time of engagement, and uh, some of you have a group one envelope. Can you stand up, please? <coughs> this is an exercise that requires the people to move and stand up. So if you have an envelope, please open the envelope. <coughs> Do you see a big file? No? And what it says in that piece of paper inside? Fall from the roof. So in 2017, we had eight fatalities related to falling from the roof. To put this in perspective and look at this, say, uh, gentlemen. And behind one of which uh, number, uh, there is a family. It's all it says, fall from the roof. 2017. You can see that. Thank you, man. Introduce Introduce the next. Uh, who's next in the Mr. Alistair. Again? No. No, no, no. This is the Go. Okay, go on up. Mr. Hyde? Mr. Hyde, come on up, sir. You just hand it to him. And, yeah, there you go. We've got to sequence a little bit. If you, you have, have him the two. envelope, do I need to go up there? Group two envelope, Step, stand up. Similar to the previous one. Oh, I'm sorry. This is group two. Um, there are 10 folks standing. Last year, 10 folks in Texas in the industry died of fall to a lower level. Like Luciano said, not only did we lose these folks, as you see represented in quantity here, but we also changed the trajectory of those folks' families for generations to come as a result of falling to a lower level. It's an exposure we have every day of the week in our jobs. It is our shared responsibility to mitigate that and manage it uh, so that we can eliminate the, the possibilities of these reoccurring. Uh, as a trend, the, the same numbers are tracking this year as it was last year. So um, we, we need to increase our focus on activities like this so we can keep people from losing their lives as a result of what we choose to do for a living. Thank you all. Next up, we have uh, Scott and Tim McGee.
All right, everybody hear me okay? All right, I'm Scott Owen, I'm the training manager for Jeannie. And uh, the first thing I'd like to do is thank all of you for coming here today. And I'd like to thank Ocean CSLA for the opportunity to come and present uh, to you as well. Um, I have been with Jeannie for 35 years, and uh, the information that I'm going to share with you today is absolutely critical, uh, not just for you to see in here, but for you to take back and share with, with your folks as well. Uh, so I'm going to go through this. I have a lot of slides, but we're going to get through this pretty quickly. Uh, Airwork platforms fall basically in four different categories. They, they fall in self-propelled um, and manually propelled lifts. So the first one is a manually propelled airwork platform, push around lift. The second category is self-propelled vertical lifts, which are scissor lifts, runabouts, single personnel lifts, articulated and, and uh, telescopic booms, and then finally trailer mounted booms. All of these machines are designed to do one thing, and that is to help you guys work safely at height. And airwork platforms are used in just about every phase of construction, uh, and they are used constantly. So it's ironic that according to the International Powered Access Federation, or IPAP, the number one leading cause of fatality involving airwork platform is falling from height. That's crazy, right? These machines are designed to let you work safely at height, and the number one cause of fatality is falling to your death, <coughs> followed by overturning, electrocution, and entrapment. But for the sake of this conference, I'm going to focus primarily on fall protection and fall prevention. So we're going to start with vertical lifts. On vertical lifts, and again, those are manually propelled push-arounds, self-propelled scissor lifts, and self-propelled single personnel lifts, the platform guardrail is considered fall protection. These machines, there's no way you can fall out of one of these machines if you keep your feet flat on the floor of the platform, which is the number one rule when you're operating any arrow or platform. And as you can see, these machines are straight up and down machines. They don't have any type of a cantilever effect, so there is no potential for catapult out of the platform like you get with other types of aerial platforms. So as long as you keep your feet flat on the floor of these machines, you're not going to fall out. So how do you fall out of a scissor lift? Well, here's one way. <laughs> you're going to see this on just about every job site out there across America. You're going to see this. These, these guys do this a thousand times and they get away with it and then there's that one day where they have grease on their boot or they got in a fight with their wife the night before or whatever and yet they slip and they fall and this is leads this is a third of the fatalities that involve scissor lifts at heights of less than 10 feet. You slip, you fall, land on your head and your, your family is, is without you for the rest of their lives. It's heartbreaking. The other way to fall from a scissor lift, simply getting out of the machine and doing something like this, and then slipping and falling to your death. Those are really the two primary ways of falling out of a scissor lift, and obviously, neither one of them are from standing inside the machine, right? Booms are a little bit different. And again, booms, sick booms or telescopic booms, articulated or Z-booms, and trailer mounted booms. As you can see, these machines are not straight up and down machines. So personal fall protection equipment is absolutely required on this equipment, and that's a full body harness and an appropriate lanyard. And I'll talk about what an appropriate lanyard is in a minute. Now you can see these machines are not straight up and down machines. These machines do have a cantilever design to allow you to outreach over things to get to your job site, which also means that there is potential for catapulting out of this platform. And that's why you have to wear personal fall protection equipment. So in this picture here, I'm wearing what's called a fall restraint lanyard. It's a short lanyard that will not allow my body to physically be thrown from the platform. I cannot leave that platform. And then once I'm above my, my minimum fall distance calculation, which I'll talk about in a minute, I can switch over to a longer lanyard so I can move around the platform, or I can choose to use a self-retracting lifeline, and I'll talk about that in a minute as well. So how do you fall from a boom? Again, getting out of the platform and not being tied up. You can exit an elevated boom platform as long as you're wearing the proper fall protection equipment and you're following the guidance that the manufacturers have provided for you. But this is not how you do it. This, is, this individual is one slip away from falling to his death. Standing up on the platform guardrails. Again, this individual is at extreme height, as you can tell. His fall protection equipment, if you can see it, is hung over the side of the platform guardrail. Can you imagine what would happen to this individual if he slipped and fell, or if a forklift clipped the tire at the, at the bottom of the machine? He's gone, right? That's how you fall from a boom. I want you to take a look at this picture. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this picture at the end of my presentation, too. 
simply overloading the machine, a lot of times the machine will fall over, but sometimes the machine will actually break. And as you can see, uh, three individuals got jumped out of the machine. If they hadn't been wearing fall protection, these three individuals are hanging over 100 feet above concrete and steel girders. This is a, a ride at Universal Studios are building called Volcano Bay. And uh, I'll, I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. Now, you've heard me talk about catapult a couple of times, and there are still individuals out there that don't believe that that's possible. As a matter of fact, the TV show Mythbusters actually said that they busted the myth and that you can't be catapulted from a boom. But they did everything except for the one thing that causes catapult. So I'm going to show you this first one. The videos didn't load. I guess they didn't link it up. All right, sorry about that. Uh, there are two videos out there. We have a lot of videos on the internet, actually, that you can view. Um, the first one I was going to show you is an individual trying to drive a boom off of about an 18-foot high concrete slab. And he comes off with rear wheels first and almost gets tossed out. And instead of stopping and thinking, maybe I should slow down a little bit, he comes off even faster, and it throws him 15 feet in the air, and he comes crashing down on his legs, tries to get up and falls back down, obviously in extreme pain. The second one is a, a fairly new video of an individual trying to unload a machine off of a trailer uh, with about a 36-inch drop. And when that new machine drops down, it throws him right out of the platform. This individual was wearing a lanyard, but it was a six-foot lanyard, and he got banged around something terrible, a rag doll being thrown from the platform. So fall protection equipment and appropriate fall protection equipment is crucial. So when we uh, take a look at fall protection equipment, you have to calculate your minimum fall distance calculation. So in this example, they're saying if you take a six foot tall individual and you put a six foot uh, shock absorbing lanyard on that in individual and you throw them over the platform, with the stretch in the harness, the shock cap will rip out at additional three to three and a half feet of length on the platform uh, lanyard. And then the deflection of the boom this individual has to be at least 18 and a half feet in the air before he will ensure that he can't strike the ground, and that's just wearing a six-foot lanyard, right? So you have to determine what that calculation is. The last thing you want to do is be thrown out of a boom at 18 feet in the air and hit the ground, right? You can imagine what that's going to do to you. So anytime that you're driving a machine in a stowed position or that you are below your minimum fall distance calculation, which for an average person is going to be about 18 and a half feet, you have to wear a fall restraint lanyard or a self-retracting lifeline. Self-retracting lifeline will lock up and, and not allow you to come from the platform. Or if you rotate it over a structure, like you see in this picture here on the right, uh, and you're not 18 and a half feet above that structure, you need to wear a fall restraint or a self-retracting lifeline. Anytime you're above the minimum fall distance calculation, you can either switch over to a six-foot shock absorbing lanyard so you can move around the platform and do your work, or you can wear a self-retracting lifeline that will move with you and allow you to do that as well. It's just important to know uh, what are the appropriate landers when you're operating the, the, the different types of machines, right? So what are the first steps in preventing falls? Uh, the first thing is proper training. Proper training is absolutely critical. So when I talk about uh, you know, training, American National Standards Institute or ANSI, standards writing body for for the United States, right? And ANSI states that whenever a user, when they say a user, think employer. Whenever the employer directs or authorizes an individual to operate an aerial platform, the employer shall ensure that the operator has been trained before being assigned to drive the machine, have been familiarized on that specific machine before they can operate it, are aware of their responsibilities as operators, and then are retrained as, as necessary based on the user's observation. So there is no expiration for operator training as far as ANSI is concerned. It's up to the employer to make that determination. So in essence, only personnel who will receive general instructions regarding inspection, application, and operation of aerial platforms, including recognition and avoidance of hazards associated with its use, shall operate an aerial platform. I'm, I'm here to let you know that there are a lot of organizations out there that will come out and do these 30-minute training sessions for you guys. And that is not training. That does not constitute training. Don't fall for that. A good operator training course is going to be three to six hours in length or more, right? If it's not, it's not training. Your people are, are not being trained properly. And it's going to contribute to the, the things that we're talking about today. Now, ANSI standards are voluntary, but when OSHA doesn't have a regulation that pertains to a specific topic in an industry, they will seek out best practices and adopt those, the incorporation by reference, and enforce those under their general duty clause. And OSHA enforces the ANSI A92 standards under their general duty clause. 
So not following the ANSI standards would be considered a violation of OSHA's general duty clause, and they take that very, very seriously. You know, when you see the number of fatalities that occur, they should take it very seriously, and there's no wonder. Now, I'm going back to this, uh, this graph from IPAP again, uh, because IPAP also does a root cause analysis of every fatality that they document on their website, and it's not a big shock that the number one cause of these fatalities is lack of adequate or proper operator training. If these people had been properly trained, they wouldn't have done the thing that they did to get themselves killed in the first place, or they, they may not have done that. So training is absolutely critical. So the first steps, again, proper training and proper equipment. Knowledge is key. Wearing the right equipment is also key. Uh, and that's what you need to do to keep your people safe using this equipment. Genie's mission has always been to provide innovative product and training solutions designed to improve safety and productivity in the workplace. As a matter of fact, today G is the only manufacturer that will go out into the field to provide, provide operator training for end users. We believe in it so much that we lead in training. And that is my full-time job. That's all I do. If I'm not doing presentations, I'm doing training. And we have classroom-based training and trainer courses that we do all over the country every week. We do them at end user sites and we also have them at our own training centers. And they meet all of the applicable ANSI and CSA standards for Canada. We also have online operator training course. It's the world's first OEM online operator training course. And it basically duplicates what we do in the classroom. And uh, it provides high quality training, but the learner can learn at their own pace. And it's available in English and Spanish. Uh, and it also is available for aero platforms and telehandlers as well. And of course, it does meet all the standards. We've also developed some really cool solutions to help people, because we understand a lot of times you do have to get out of the platform to do your work. So all of our six and eight foot platforms now come standard with eight lanyard attachment points. In other words, an operator can get outside the platform and work all the way around the platform with a double lanyard system and maintain 100% tie off. There's never a reason to unhook and not be tied off on a machine. We also have a floor mounted uh, anchor point that you can mount on there as well. Give you a little bit more freedom and flexibility. And of course, these all comply with applicable standards. All, all these things I'm showing you do. We work with Walt Disney World in conjunction with their technicians because they have to get out of the machines quite often to service their rides and things like that. And they didn't have a solution that they liked. So we work with them to develop the fall arrest bar. And this thing has just taken off like wildfire. Everywhere we show it, people just fall in love with it. It <coughs> mounts very quickly and easily to any six and eight foot platform. It has a sliding track design. So it's a single lane attachment point that rolls on ball bearings that allows the operator to work around the platform and the lanyard attachment point actually follows the operator wherever they go. It's a very cool design and if you move from machine to machine, again it's available on six and eight foot platforms <coughs> and it complies with all the standards. So that's, uh, if you're working outside of the platform, something to be aware of. Falling from the platform on a scissor lift, again you're standing up on the guardrails. So we've designed, designed the shoe, working with Mammoth Engineering. And the shoe mounts on the end of a scissor lift and allows the operator to get an additional 20 inches of reach up into tight confined spaces without having to get up on the platform guardrails. So this machine can be used with those platform rails up or they can actually be lowered to give the operator that much more ability <coughs> to support their entire body up in tight, you know, in like a small ceiling choice, tight workspaces, the, the belly of an aircraft, for example, um, but they're perfectly safe with the built-in fall arrest system. Right? Again, they comply with all the standards. They can be installed on any 2004 newer 30-inch Genie scissor lift. All right, so going back to this picture, rescue plan is also a really critical part of fall prevention and fall protection, right? And what do you do if somebody falls out of a platform? Now, this picture was taken at Universal Studios in Orlando, and they were working on a ride called Volcano Bay. We don't know exactly what happened with the machine, but it looks like it broke. All three individuals were dumped. And unfortunately, they were wearing fall protection equipment. But even if you're wearing proper fall protection equipment, if you're hanging suspended for more than 15 or 20 minutes, you're going to start suffering extreme physical damage. These guys worked for over half an hour trying to get to these individuals with other booms that they had on site. They didn't have anything tall enough to get to it. They called the fire department. The fire department drove out there. Their ladder truck wasn't long enough to get to these individuals. Finally, in a panic, they called the Walt Disney World who had a 180-foot boom on site. They had to load it up on a truck, drive it out there, and they got this street down, and they went instantly in critical condition into the hospital because they'd been hanging there for over an hour. All right, so you need to have a rescue plan in place that can, can guarantee that you get your people down 
within that 15 minute time period. And if you have tall booms on site, you really need to think about how you're gonna do that, right? So rescue planning is really different, three different uh, rescue types. There's self-rescue by the person involved. Now in Walt Disney World, everybody that operates a 180 foot boom wears a, a self-rescue system by DVI Solomon. It is a cool little device that mounts onto any harness and it allows the worker to pull a ripcord and it will allow the worker to descend at roughly three and a half feet per second and drop themselves down. They use a 100 foot version that allows them to drop all the way down and then they can come up underneath them with an 8 foot boom and rescue that individual. So nobody can operate those 180s without wearing this system. All right? And it's affordable, for roughly five or six hundred dollars. So why wouldn't you do something like that, right? Assisted rescue by others in the area. The, the number one step, obviously, is to make sure everybody in the area is trained to use the platform ground controls, right? Everybody should be trained on how to use those ground controls to get an in, individual down. They also need to learn how to use the auxiliary control system. Because a lot of people that don't know the machines don't understand these machines have an auxiliary lowering system that will allow you to do everything except for drive the machine. So you could blow your engine, you could run out of fuel, and if they don't know about it, they're stuck up at the end. But if you know how to operate the auxiliary controls, you can bring them down safely from the ground controls. And then having backup air work platforms on site that will allow you to reach those individuals if they do get hung up or cabin from the machine. And then there is technical rescue, typically by the fire department. Uh, but when you start talking about 180 foot booms, uh, you're gonna have to think outside the box. And sometimes you might have to bring an air rescue team to get those individuals out of that machine. So you really need to think about that, about the different machines you have on site when you are you know, setting up your, your plans. All right, I know it's a lot of information and I appreciate your time. We are gonna be outside with uh, some trailers, uh, with some platforms that have the different safety accessories on them, the fall arrest bar, our contact alarm, things like that, we'd like to show you the shoe. So when this is over, feel free to come out and, and I'll answer any questions that you have, all right? I thank you for your time and uh, I'd like to bring up Keith from Abadix. My name is Jay Dabbs. I work with TD Industries and I'm part of the CSLA Executive Committee. And before Keith comes on, uh, I'd like Group 3 to stand, please. If you have Group 3 on your envelope, please stand. Okay, so what this represents is four unnecessary fall fatalities in 2017 that resulted from falling from gas. Next, uh, Keith is here to talk to us about. Leading edge protection. Will you guys have me welcome to you? Morning. Thank you, Jamie. So today we're gonna first off thank you to CSLA, University of Texas Arlington, OSHA. Appreciate you allowing us to spend some time talking about some fall protection. So how many of us daily deal with tying off their feet leading edge applications? Almost all of us. So we see scenarios daily where people are utilizing improper equipment for tying off at your feet. So we're going to kind of dial in on the ANSI standard and the OSHA interpretation of leading edge fall protection. So I'm going to turn it over to Sean Corey. He's our local 3M fall protection specialist. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. about foot level tie off. Um, if you, you know, read the OSHA standards, kind of the, the, one of the things that they say is you're, you're not supposed to free fall more than six feet. Well, if I tie off at my feet, that kind of 
blows that all out of the, the question to begin with because I'm free falling back down to that anchor and then, if, especially if I'm using a lanyard, I've got the additional free fall beyond that point of six feet before the shock pack goes into effect. So kind of bottom line is, um, I'm not gonna sit up here and, and read all this, but um, you know, I guess the response is, there's certain applications that you don't have the luxury of tying off overhead. Um, steel workers is a prime example of that application. A lot of the type of concrete construction is working on leading edge. A lot of times we don't have that luxury to, to elevate that anchor point, which we always want to try to do if we can, but certain applications do call out for uh, foot level tile. And that brings up a whole <coughs> another set of issues or problems. Uh, web products are not really designed for sharp edge type applications. That webbing is just not strong enough if that webbing were to pass across a sharp edge it's basically going to shear off and, and it's, it's almost like not wearing fall protection at all. So ANC, um, a couple products that, that we introduced, we were the first product on the market to introduce a back mounted single leg or double leg foot level tie off sharp edge self retracting lifeline, uh, which would be our nano lock edge series of product. And we have a, a slew of different options in that category. It just really depends on you know what kind of hook you need. but. Um, there were updates to the ANSI standard back in 2012, so I just wanted to put out some of the bullet points in regards to sharp edge foot level tie off rated product. Number one, must have an integral shock absorber, must be tested to ensure the cable will not cut on an edge. That edge sharpness, is, as they test it, has to be a 0.005 thickness or edge. That's a very aggressive sharp edge that they're when they're doing the, the testing of this to make sure the products are, are compliant. Um, must still retract and extend after a fall. The locking function must uh, still work after a fall. Must maintain an average arresting force below 900 pounds and a peak force below 1800. Okay. Um, there are foot level tie off products, lanyards even. Uh, a lot of times, I, I just don't think people take the time to understand that not all products are rated for the same type of application. So as an example, I've got two different types of shock with me here today. Number one being a regular or easy stop. And if I look at the label in here, it's gonna, it's gonna specifically say, this is designed for a six foot free fall with an average arresting force of 900 pounds or less. Now, this other shock absorber, Right here, this is our Force 2 product. This is specifically designed and says so on the label, designed for that increased free fall. 12 foot of free fall. Um, but my peak force actually jumps up because of that increased free fall. It can go as high as 1350 on those ANSI specifications, okay? Um, I guess bottom line with that, we just want to make sure that when we have these specific applications, we need to choose the right equipment, okay? Um, the NanoLock Edge uses an innovative combination of lifeline material, energy absorption, and harness connection to reduce the forces on the worker and the edge. So to give you an idea of, of what this looks like integrated in, and once again, we have it available in, in a single leg or a double leg configuration, but we've got this mounted actually underneath that dorsal D-ring, so one, that's, if they do, are working in that overhead application, what that does is the housing is not beating the guy in the back of the head, um, knocking off his hard hat. Number two, it keeps that back D-ring free. Uh, the last presenter talked a lot about rescue. You're not supposed to have more than one device engaged into that dorsal D-ring, so that keeps that back D-ring free for a, a potential rescue, or if I have another application where I can can use a, a traditional lanyard, okay? Um, so this integrates into the back. It, it talked about having that external shock pack. This right here is actually our energy absorber. It's built in and it attaches to the harness. We've got a quick connect, dual action device right here. Um, and then you'll notice that this isn't like a traditional web SR, it's a cable version. So they beefed up the cable and this is actually tested to meet and, and work against that 0 .005 thickness and will not shear even at foot level foot level tile sharp edge drop so 
The weight was increased in that as well. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that, but this just um, kind of some examples, you know, like we, we said a few minutes ago, uh, guys working on high beams. Uh, we've got a couple other images for you coming up. But, um, so as far as the force is concerned, once again, the product's not specifically designed for foot level top and generate forces exceeding 1,800 pounds. A moment ago when we were describing those two different lanyards, um, the Force 2 product actually has, a normal lanyard has four foot of shock absorbing material, which is required by ANSI, okay? This guy right here actually has an additional foot of shock absorber built in, and that's what keeps that force down below that 1,800 pounds. Longer free fall, could be potentially more force that's generated, so we have to have extra shock absorbers built into these products, okay? Uh, so that's typically what we're, if you look at the image on the right in the presentation, this is the type of application that we're talking about specifically for these types of products. Nothing overhead for them to attach to. They've got to get up there, uh, work on that structure, and typically they're utilizing some sort of anchor point like this, a beam glider that they're attaching to at their feet. This beam glider slides back and forth, so it does give them the ability to move around on that job site. Um, and depending on the, the size of that I beam, they can adjust it up or down. But that's a very typical example of the, the type of work that we're, we're talking about here. So what, what are all the hazards? Well, I've got trip hazards, dangerous forces from that increased free fall, fall clearance issues, okay? Fall clearance is another big part of this. A lot of the applications that we have and what we we were told earlier in some of the earlier presentations is a lot of these fatalities or injuries are happening at, at low clearance levels. Therefore, the benefit of getting into a, a self-retracting lifeline versus the traditional lanyard. Um, the, the previous presentation said, you know, it, minimum 18 and a half feet of clearance for that worker from the anchor point to the obstruction or for the ground. These retractables, the technology is sort of like a seatbelt in, in a car. It gives me the ability to move in and out away from that anchor point, but in the, the instance it recognizes that fall, it's going to lock up very quickly and arrest that fall. So just an example, some information on how a lanyard would work from a clearance perspective on the right versus the Nano Force Edge. I do want to say that that's working directly on that leading edge. If I do have these applications, uh, concrete forming would be a prime example. If I can get that anchor point a foot, two foot, three foot back away from that leading edge, that's going to really drop that dramatically. This is a, that 16 foot clearance requirement is a worst case scenario if I'm anchored right on that leading edge. So any any opportunity I have to get that anchor point back further away from that leading edge, that is going to reduce the amount of clearance required. Okay? Uh, some other technologies that we've recently launched are Smart Lock. This is another uh, product that's uh, designed for that foot level tie off. Okay? Um, this is for areas where I might need something longer. So I've got uh, 30 foot, 50 foot uh, product available. <laughs> this one also has an updated thicker edge cable. You'll notice a lot of the, the products that we're doing in that foot level tie-off have that orangish. And that gives the, the safety managers from the ground the visual indicator that they are utilizing the right uh, product from a distance. So we color code these specifically in that. Um, so what we did with this product is uh, a lot of times when we're, we're working and, and doing foot level tie off leading edge type work, these retractables will constantly have tension or if the workers move too fast just trying to get their job done, that, that SRL locks up on them and it can jerk them back. And a lot of times what we're seeing is we're getting that false impact indicator uh, or false deployment showing on that, that cable. So our engineers designed this. It's got a, a technology on the inside where it has magnets where it alleviates that 
instant lockup from happening. It's a much smoother, and, and as we go outside, and for those of you who can, can join us, we can demonstrate the difference of, of how this product works versus a traditional retractable. It's much smoother. Um, if I let this go versus the other one, they, uh, the new smart lock technology, you can definitely visually see the difference of how this retracts versus the other one. Just much smoother operation. So we, we utilize a lot of our internal people at 3M to, to develop this um, and actually put modules on the worker's body doing those repetitive motions that you would typically find on a, a construction site. And that, that helped us get the, uh, the type of product that we wanted as far as functionality is, is concerned. So a couple more images there. Um, key features, the handle for easy. Uh, carrying around the job site, high vis energy absorber, uh, specifying that that's a leading edge uh, product. Another a problem that we run into, labels must be present and fully legible on all of your equipment. A lot of times when they're mounting these oh, traditional retractables, the labels get rubbed off. So we do have a redundant labeling system that's built into underneath this bumper right here. So I pull the bumper back and that label, of course, it's not going to work. <laughs> there we go. You can see the redundant label that, that basically kind of scrolls out there. So that keeps my product in service longer. Okay, I don't have to remove it just to get the label done. Um, one of the other things, the former presenter with Jeannie, talked a little bit about descent and rescue. It is a vital component and probably the most overlooked outside of choosing the wrong equipment for the, for the application. Uh, descent and rescue is probably the most overlooked portion of, a, of the fall arrest uh, plan. Guys, that suspension trauma is bad news. Another one of the products in, in conjunction with the self-rescue unit that that gentleman was talking about. Here's an example of it. Uh, we've had a lot of success with our Rollbliss R550. This is a really nice device, and we've got one we can show you outside as well. But what this is, allows you to do is this comes in basically whatever rope length you need. We've got 100 foot, 200 foot, 300. You wide, widely out in wind towers where they're they're up on a 300 foot tower. But basically, the the difference with this this is more of an assisted rescue type feature. So basically, I would lower this down to the worker. They can integrate into their, their D ring, and the person performing the rescue uses that wheel to raise them up just enough to take the tension off of their lanyard or retractable that they're suspended from. So they raise them up enough to, to take the tension off and disconnect them from the anchor point, and then they can just let it free wheel. And it's similar to that other rescue device where it's a controlled descent, three and a half feet three and a half feet per second all the way to the ground. So it eliminates another worker from having to go into suspension to perform that rescue. If, if they needed to do a pickoff move of some sort, they could utilize this and attach it to, to the worker who's doing the rescue and lower themselves down and lock it out and then tie into the worker. Just a lot of different ways to utilize this particular device. Um, been very successful for us. I guess bottom line is, as we go back out onto the job site, we want to make sure we are taking the time, including that rescue, uh, into, into our fall protection plan. Nothing worse than, than, oh my gosh, somebody's fallen, I have to come up with a plan. I haven't even thought about what I'm going to do. It can be as simple as getting a ladder or a lift or, or whatever down to that, underneath that worker, but we've got to have something to eliminate that suspension trauma because as, as you mentioned, 15, 20 minutes, there have been people who've been suspended in the harness, they get rescued and that pressure is relieved and that toxic blood goes through their body and it's, it, it's killed a few people. So have that plan in place ahead of time. Um, this is just a small portion of, of, of what we do as, as far as a fall protection company, but um, just wanted to, to share this stuff with you. We appreciate the opportunity to be here, so thank you guys very much for the invitation. And, and, We will have Mr. Jonathan Stewart, I believe, with Indian scaffolding come up. 
Everybody, while he's taking off his uh, mic, can I get all of y'all just to stand up for just one minute? Okay, everybody, just stand up right quick. All right, everybody, take your right hand and touch it to the back of your head. All right, this morning, whenever I left the house, I told my wife that I can get people to do whatever I want, whenever I want, and that's why I come to work. All right, thank you. <laughs> Alright, I have a hard time standing still. That's one reason why I want everybody to stand up for a second. Let me find a little clicker. Alright, when we're talking about scaffolding, I try to keep everything very, very simple. As you can see, there's only a few parts to the scaffold. Doesn't matter what the scaffold is, doesn't matter how big it is, how small it is, whether it rolls, whether it's hanging, no matter what it is, the scaffold is only a basic thing. And so what I want to talk about today is whenever you guys go out and you're inspecting a scaffold, you're looking at it, uh, getting ready to do your daily inspection, this is all you have to check. This is all that keeps everybody alive. Okay? If all these things are in place, the only thing left to kill somebody on a scaffold is stupid. Alright? Because if every bit of this scaffold is working properly, it's no different than whenever the guys are in the aerial lifts and they're standing up on top of it. Whenever they're not using their harness. I came from the tower industry. Nobody ever fell off of a tower. They jumped. Because if they were tied off, they wouldn't have gone anywhere. And that's how I always looked at it. Same thing with the scaffold. If everything is in place, stupid's the only thing that can make it go wrong. Every morning there's always usually a meeting on the job site. You got all the superintendents together, uh, safety guys in there. He's talking about 1945 whenever he uh, first got into the industry. I'm one of those, but not since then. Uh, and this whole time they're having this meeting, at the end of it, somebody tells the superintendent, Hey, did you inspect your scaffold this morning? Oh, yeah. He's on the phone, he's walking out there, he's talking, he's mad because he's not getting this truck, he's mad because he's not getting that. He walks over to the scaffold, he signs off on it, and he walks away. Happens every day, I see it on job sites all the time. When that guy walks away, he's not the one that's going to fall off of there. Okay? Chances are, he's not the one that's even going to climb up there. Alright, so he's just going to walk away. He's going to go back. He's going to do his paperwork. Then later in the day, say she guys going to come by and he goes, why are there no toll work on this guy? Oh, you signed off on it. I never got hit in the head because somebody kicked a hammer off of there. Well, I was in a hurry this morning. I didn't have time whatever else excuse you come up with. As a project manager and a safety director, I know two things whenever a superintendent's mouth is moving. One, he's lying, and two, he's in a hurry because he's gotta go do something else, okay? When you guys get out there in every day, it's very basic. You gotta start from the bottom, you go to the top. I see guys all the time, they'll get on the scaffold, they walk up to it, they climb on it, they're looking around, okay, it's got all the handrails. Never once did they look to see if a forklift the day before had cratered the base over on the other side. So when I talk about these parts here, every one of them has these basic things to it. It has a base, it has bracing, it has access, it has fall protection, it has a walking surface. That's all there is to a scaffold. That's it. No matter what it is. Well, that looks a lot smaller up there. <laughs> I can't even read it. So, good thing I don't read slides. All right. So whenever you're looking at it, whenever I always walk up to one, the first thing I tell people whenever I'm giving a class or whatever, check the base. Hey, is the base there? If we have any masons in the group that came from the residential side, you know that the base is optional. And it always has been. 
<laughs> you can get a five gallon bucket under there, a two by four, whatever, you got a base. All right? So when you get up there, check and make sure your base is there. Did we get rain last night? Was this scaffold built where there was going to be a drainage ditch and it's not in yet because it needed to be leveled so they could put the scaffold there? Well, that drainage ditch is going there for a reason. Because water's coming through no matter what. So one of the legs that, that uh, the day before was perfectly level, it is still level. If it's not, don't let anybody on it. Okay? Call the guy who built it, hopefully it was us, to come out and fix it. Okay? As you're going along and you're looking at the scaffold, and if y'all want later, I've got some of these cards, the real basic of what to look at, and they're small enough you can put them inside your hard hat. After you've checked the base, what I always do is I look to see, is my bracing still intact? Okay? Did anybody remove anything? Is there anything laying on the ground that was up there yesterday or before the shift started? I look that over and I see that, you know, all my bracing's intact. All right. Is my fall protection still intact? My guardrails. Or was this a scaffold that couldn't have guardrails for some reason? Are we in a plant where, there, where there's a pipe in the way? Is there some reason why this couldn't happen? Well, if I can't have the guardrails, is there, somebody, is there something telling the guy that's going to get on here, hey, you're going to have to use fall protection on this scaffold. You may not have to use it at this end, but when you get to point B, there's a spot down there you're going to have to put fall protection on to, to work on this scaffold. So are all my handrails in? Has anybody come up, taken these handrails off, loaded on a pallet, and then just started working? Now that all the stuff that's on the pallet that's keeping them from falling off the edge, now there's just a pallet there, and so they just walk right off the edge. Is all that stuff back in place? That's the basics. Is my platform still here? These platforms have checkers on. I will tell you, you get a 70 mile an hour wind in downtown Dallas at 15 stories in the air, those things will go. <laughs> All right? I walked onto a job site, we had a scaffold hanging out of a window off of the 15th floor that went up to the 17th floor. The wind got in so bad that it had popped these and literally laid the plank back up on its top there. Didn't go to ground, but it laid it back up on its top. So we got out there and wired that whole thing down to get rain for the rest of the, or didn't get wind for the rest of the project. So whenever you're looking at the platform itself, is everything still there? If you've got wood planks, has somebody moved them? Because they were six inches over the edge. Okay? Had something bumped into them when they were setting stuff up here? Did the forklift push them back in and are they just barely hanging? Did something like that happen? One of the falls that they were talking about whenever the four people stood up earlier from uh, falls from a scaffold, one of the falls that was involved with that was during a disassembly and they were moving the planks. They had removed one row of planks and what they didn't see as the guy was coming down is that this row was on, the, was on the edge. He fell 55 feet. He hit concrete. Concrete one. Hit him zero. All right? So when you're looking at the, at the whatever you're going to be standing on, is it stable? Okay? I see some wood plank out there some days, and I'm like, I wouldn't even let termites on this. Okay? So whenever you see that, Number one rule, it's just plank, throw it out, all right? There's no, you know, I can't put, I can put a price on plank, it's so much per foot. I can't put a price on anybody in here, okay? I got a couple of my guys here that, uh, that are two of my builders. I'm not gonna put a price on, on Junior or Myron and say, hey, okay, we can get one more day out of this plank, or, you know, I can, I can do this inspection later, okay? I can't put prices on them. All right? I can't put prices on, on the salesman. I, sometimes I would like to. I can't put prices on my VP. Sometimes I'd like to. But whenever we're looking at this, take the time. It's just a few basic parts. That's all it is. Get your superintendents off their phone. Get them to walk the scaffold. 
We build scaffolds that are huge. And yeah, it'll take a long time to walk one. Well, if you've got four or five competent people, who says they can't all do it together that morning right quick? All right? They all check the base, then they all start going and checking levels. And it's quick and it's done. But everybody, you've got competent people on there checking everything. All right? You're getting an overall view of the whole thing. We do a scaffold every, uh, every uh, fall. We do the Dallas Cowboys team picture. Uh, we've been doing it now for 45 years. I've just, just been involved for the last couple of years. If scaffold plank will hold the Dallas Cowboys line and it's in good shape, I promise you, it will hold what you guys are doing if it's taken care of. It gets pretty, it's kind of cool whenever you watch that millions and millions of dollars get up on your scaffold planks and they're all standing up there joking around and playing and everything like that. And then the Jones family walks up the back and gets across the top and you're sitting there going, man, I hope that plank was clean. <laughs> but no, one of the big problems we always see out there is guys are overloading the scaffolds. Yeah, it's got a four to one safety factor in it. But that does not mean you have to test that, okay? If we say that it'll hold 25 pounds per square foot, yeah, it'll hold 100. But that doesn't mean you have to test it. That means stop there, go home at the end of the day, come back, put 25 pounds on again the next day. It's that simple. One of the main things whenever we're talking, like what I was saying on the plane, because the plane gets a lot of people killed. Just throw it out. If you need a new plank, there's our website up there, call us. We'll, we'll be more than happy to get it out there to you. But besides that, every day, just, this is something that doesn't have anything to do with scaffold. I always, always try to make sure that, you know, hey, you know, I want to go home, I want, you know, everybody works for me to go home. And everybody always talks about how, you know, they have a loved one, you know, that you, they want you to go home to. You know, I was talking about earlier how generations will be affected. But one thing I always try to tell people is that whenever we have, or whenever I think of fatalities, I also think about the loved ones who get angry. All right? And anger, to me, is 10 times worse than sadness. Okay? Because anger will eat you to the core. So when, this is something always that I try to tell people. With my, with my family, I have four beautiful kids, a couple of grandkids that are amazing, but I have one son. My son is a, a NRA expert marksman. He's a gold medalist in jiu-jitsu. He's an all-state rugby player, and right now he's in the Army. I have three daughters. They love me to death. They're going to cry a lot if something happens to them. My son's going to be angry. So if you're the one inspecting the scaffold, and something happens to me, you do not have to worry about the three daughters, okay? It's the son, the angry son that you have to worry about. And that's what I just I always tell people that, you know, you don't want that on your shoulders. You don't want somebody being mad at you for the rest of their life because you didn't do your job. Anybody got any questions? We know this is going fast, but if you got any questions about scaffold or anything like that, we'll be around afterwards. Uh, I'll be more than happy to talk to you. All right. If you're in group five, would you please stand up? Group five. Well, guess what? I'm the other one in group five. <laughs> guess what? I got a mad son because I just fell through a skylight. Okay? So coming up next to talk is going to, Bob Brown's going to come back up. Uh, he's with UTA and he's going to uh, go into some of the education part of this. Uh, did anybody learn anything today? Yeah, all right, all right. Well, that's what education and training is all about, is trying to take something away and learn something. So Jonathan tried something, so I'm going to try it. Raise your right hand. 
power sign. Okay. <laughs> Make the OK sign. Now put the OK sign on your chin. On your chin. Ah, okay. Learned something else, didn't you? All right. Yeah. What, uh, people are looking at you. You know, Jonathan was talking. We we're talking about aerial lifts. We we're talking about scaffolding. We we're talking about ladders. We talked about statistics. There's a lot of hazards out there. We need to make sure people do the right thing. And you are the examples. And the people that do the training and education are the examples that, that set the stage for performing safely. So we've talked a lot about training and education today. There's a lot of resources to that. I just want to point out that uh, we are one of the OSHA education. There's four education centers here in Region uh, 6. And we work closely with OSHA and, and everybody else we can in the region to try and provide a safety emphasis and education and training. So we have training. We provide OSHA training on fall protection. And OSHA in their standards spends a lot of time on training, especially in fall protection. It's one of the major sections under fall protection talks about training. It's important. The training you do every morning or before every task is critical. And making sure that's the correct training for that task is important. And we're glad to help you. Last week, we provided free training. I just want you to know we do that uh, for these events uh, every year. So for fall uh, stand down, we provide free training. We have a one day fall protection class that gives you kind of highlights of some of the things we've covered here today. And we try to host an event like this where we bring in people and provide some kind of opportunity for you to, to gain more knowledge and, and insight. We also, we talk about safe and sound coming up, we will be providing safe training on safety program management again. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities for free training that we do offer. Uh, well, Doug mentioned the conference coming up in September, the Construction Safety Conference. There will be free training for that. In fact, we will be talking about, I think Silica is one of the main, we have fall protection class, as part of that, we have a confined space class, and there'll be a course on silica and uh, process safety management. So we will have an opportunity to, to provide free training as part of that conference, in addition to the breakout se sessions. So there'll be half day or whole day sessions of training that will be available. In addition to that, we, as an education center, provide that OSHA training. We have a fall protection uh, training class that we provide that's a 20, uh, 22 and a half hour class that meets the OSHA requirements. We also do what we call our competent person class that goes over not only OSHA but all the ANSI standards and the Corps of Engineer requirements on competent persons for fall protection. So there's a lot of opportunities to, for you to gain training and knowledge. Uh, free ones like this, uh, other free sessions, please take advantage of those so that you can improve your skills and pass those on to the other people you work with. It's important. We want everybody to go home to their families. Uh, hopefully we stress that enough today and that's the purpose of us uh, partnering with CSLA and OSHA is to make sure everybody goes home safe to their families. So I'm going to be followed uh, by Mike Dickerson. into harnesses and on swing stages and boom lifts, we got to think about how we're getting them down. On, on one job I was at, we had, um, it was after uh, turnover, and we had to go back and do some work for a few weeks. Uh, all our boom lifts had left the site, and we had to keep a 135-foot boom lift, or rent a 135-foot boom lift, keep an operator on the job, and, you know, went on for weeks, but it was a great investment. Um, but a few things with suspension trauma. Um, uh, Scott said that the folks at Disney were rescued after being up there an hour. That's not the norm necessarily. Uh, a lot of times those people that do go to the hospital in critical condition uh, don't come out alive. Um, if we are working from height, the goal of someone falls is to try to get them down in 10 to 15 minutes. Um, when I first started getting into safety, it was 30. 
and we've started seeing more and more people not survive these events, and now it's 10 to 15 minute window. Um, planning to use your local fire department, in my eyes, isn't necessarily a plan. Um, unless you have them involved and have them on site and know that they're available. Um, you know, can they respond? Do they have a long enough ladder? On a lot of our jobs, they don't have a, a long enough uh, ladder truck. Do they have access to the side where somebody's suspended? You know, if, if you have a narrow path or it's blocked with construction material, it's not going to be a feasible solution. Um, aerial and scissor lifts can be a really great option. Uh, if you have the same considerations thought out with can they get to that side, um, are they uh, large enough, all that type of stuff. Um, ladders, scaffolding, uh, there's self-rescue options like we're trying to show there on the right with those trauma relief straps. Um, I bought a set this week just because we've been talking about this and I've realized it's something that's very important. If I ever fall, I would like to, have to be able to pop those out of my harness and give myself some relief. Um, there's <coughs> options for self-rescue with ladders. If you have cranes in your job site, there's um, man baskets that are avail available and rescue baskets. And you know, a, a contraption like this is probably going to be a little bit pricey, but man baskets uh, aren't necessarily that expensive. Um, so. There's tons of options, and we listed a few more today that I just learned about. So like with the heat campaign, OSHA has kind of a formula here, uh, plan, provide, and train. So under the planning as aspect, you know, realizing that it's not one size fits all, um, we have to walk the job before starting. And ideally, it's not just the guy that bids the job, it's the folks that are doing the work, that they understand what's going to be necessary to do it and do it safely. Uh, that's a big responsibility of supervision to make sure that the guys have everything they need to do um, their work, material, equipment, all that type of stuff. Um, hold pre-construction meetings. Utilize your job planning processes, AHA, JHA, pre-task plans. Um, it all pays off. You know, how materials are going to be loaded. How are you going to get material into the building? How are you going to get material out of the building or trash it out? Um, we have so many unique as uh, access issues in construction, and we've only talked about a few today. Um, you know, 3M DVI, they just cover the leading edge aspect of this type of work, and there's so much more there. Uh, provide. You know, I see a lot of contractors around town in their trucks or vans and they're driving around with one or two ladders. How many do they probably need? Several. You know, maybe half a dozen to do all the work that they need to do. I've had a couple contractors to my house recently, and they've had to borrow my ladders because they show up, you know, I 10 foot ceiling. Oh, I'll, I only brought a four foot ladder, you know? And the folks in our jobs are the same way. Um, so it's another big consideration. So. Um, whether it's ladders, aerial lifts, scaffold, however we're getting to the work, obtaining the right equipment is definitely a good investment. Uh, training, Bob talked about the opportunities with UTA. There's quite a few more uh, options out there. If, you, uh, if their class schedule doesn't work for you, there's even now, uh, I think, I believe Guardian provides it, it's an eight hour online competent person level course. I'm not saying eight hours is the right number or online is the right uh, delivery method, but new options all the time. Um, I've been through several days of fall protection training and I feel like I learn something new every single week. Um, I highly recommend uh, UTA's offerings. Um, and Bob mentioned the OSHA required training. There's OSHA requirements for fall protection, ladders, scaffolding, um, aerial lifts is kind of, uh, you know, an OSHA 5A1 general duty clause type of thing. Um, but there's, uh, there's a lot of options. Has anybody heard anyone talk about the distinction between these two terms, compliance versus safety? Um, there, there is a difference. And, you know, although it takes a lot of effort to gain compliance and to get to that level, um, 
it's not necessarily where we want to stay. Uh, it takes years for OSHA to update their standards. Um, no offense to them, but they don't have the latest and greatest. You know, when was the last time it was updated, Doug, in the 90s? Yep. And did we have, you know, the nano lock and all this other stuff then? Yeah, absolutely not. So there's exemptions written in that we may not necessarily have to take advantage of. You know, fall protection plans and safety monitor systems, control decking zones, controlled access zones, they may not be feasible anymore. They may not be uh, an exemption that we should be taking advantage of with all the technology that's on the market. And, you know, I know I deal with a lot of contractors that still believe that we should be taking advantage of these things and we should really reflect on whether it's appropriate to your situation. There might be something out there that's uh, gonna provide better safety for the employees doing the work. And safety meaning, you know, better manage risk. And, you know, we're not just attempting to stay in compliance with a rule. We're actually trying to prevent the falls, prevent injuries and fatalities um, versus the rule. So, you know, compliance is a great place to start if, you're not doing anything, it's, it's definitely better than nothing. But if you can get into the next level, which is safety, um, and trying to do the right thing, that's where I hope that our industry can get to. Um, so concluding, uh, the Construction Safety Leadership Alliance has its next meeting in June. 11.30 to 1, uh, we hold it at the Workforce Development Building here at UTA. Um, it's a great opportunity. You can sign up on our website, www.csla.us, and you can see the box right there, attend our next meeting, and that'll have the link to be able to sign up um, for what we have upcoming. Topic changes with the wind and, and what is current in our industry and what we're talking about and what folks want to hear about. Uh, it's a great group and awesome format. Um, so LinkedIn, we're there too. Um, so just to conclude today, we really appreciate everybody's attendance here uh, live and on the webinar. Uh, directly after we have demonstrations from 3M and Jeannie's got a lot of cool stuff to show off. Um, so that's gonna be behind the facility, but you'll have to go out through the front door and hang a right, correct, to get there? Yep. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so like Bob said, I hope somebody, or all of us learned something new today. Uh, I know I did. And, you know, just one drop at a time, right, Mike? That's right, sir. <laughs> all right. Um, anybody have any questions before we break? Okay. I have a question. Yeah, Mike. Now, uh, uh, I hope you can hear okay, because for me, in the highway industry, sir, you know, I've seen many different warning lines, but I, I'm kind of curious, what makes a good warning line? Because of the different styles, what's acceptable? Okay. Um, so, it depends on what work we're doing. If we are doing leading edge work, meaning we're building out or constructing the edge, like we're laying decking or we're doing concrete form work and we're building out, then that's when we, when we can have a six foot line. But other trades, it's 15 foot. Now, it's not like a guardrail where you have um, that 200 pound protection. It's just space from the edge. And those posts only have to be able to support 16 pounds. So it's just something you run into, letting you know you're backing up. Do you guys use them a lot? Yes, but we've gotten away from the PVC red danger tape or the yellow caution tape and gone to something more substantial. Well, that's because it's no good. Yeah. Good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, our, our friends at OSHA say that it has to have 500 pound braking strength. And okay. so that's flag rope or, you know, you buy the warning line off the shelf. Absolutely. And a little bit better than caution, caution or danger tape. I, I try to tell our folks not to ever use that for a fall scenario more than six foot. Anybody else? Okay. Hey, one more thing though, yeah. before we go, I, I want to say thank you to Amadix. Truly, they, they brought lunch and, and, you know, holy cow, we're a lot of things, but without food, we're not much. And I want to say thank you, sir.
thank you very much. And, and as Mike had said, and right outside there, we've got Jeannie, we've got 3M with Sean out back, and, and of course, the big man, Keith. Please take, take a moment to go out there and, and see what they've got. It, it's cool stuff, you know, that technology's taking us a long way, especially in fall protection. Holy cow, I, I truly, I learned a lot today, and I want to thank each and every one of you. Because without you, we're not going to be successful. Thank you. Thank you. The worker on this side would complete the three exercises before the one on using this one can complete one of the, the obstacles. So it's it's from a product productivity standpoint, it's it's kind of a no-brainer. But also from the you know safety side of things, leading edge, sharp edge, you can see the difference also in the diameter of the cable between those two. This one's rated leading edge. This one's not. This one's really just designed for that overhead work there. So what we can also do is show you guys what happens in a fall. I'll get it rigged up where we use the same weight that they use in the ANSI test labs and on the back of our truck this gauge we can measure how much force is created on a fall and OSHA says that we're not supposed to have more than 1,800 pounds of force put on that worker's body. So we're going to do two drops for you. One with, like the genie guy was saying, you know, in a lift, a lot of times they use like a restraint laner. There's no shock absorber on here. So we'll, we'll drop that one, and then we'll do the same drop, but we've added a shock absorber. So you guys can tell the difference visually, but also see how those numbers correlate to what the OSHA regulations are. in the ANSI test lab and what ANSI has done is they they use this this 282 pound weight and it mirrors dropping a 310 pound workload capacity which that's what most fall protections written around is a, a max workload of 310 pounds they need you to go up and pick that up and hang it on that hook <laughs> got that noose is I've incorporated that shock pack so like we talked about inside you got to be mindful of your clearance ANSI requires four feet of shock absorbing material in a standard lanyard when we're talking this foot level tie-offs they actually add a foot okay 
But um, the other thing I'm going to have to do different on this one is elevate my anchor point. I'm going to have to get this as high as possible because the one thing that this does not show very well is the worker body. So this D-ring represents the D-ring of our harness. And I don't know if you've ever seen somebody suspended in a harness before, but even if it's properly donned, that harness will change the way it fits your body. That D-ring engages and it typically slides up to about the top of your head. So you kind of got a picture or tack on the rest of that worker's body suspended underneath that weight to give a true idea from a clearance perspective. up about 15 feet in the air. I guess what I would just ask, have we ever seen somebody working 15 feet in the air using a six foot shock absorbing lanyard as their fall and rest device? And let's see what, how that would work out. Close to 4,500 pounds on that first drop. You can see how violent that was, rocking back and forth. I'm pretty much zeroed out. Three, two, one. You notice that weight was much more controlled at the end of the fall. It wasn't bouncing back and forth. I went from 4,500 down to 864 pounds of force on that drop, so I'm well below what OSHA requires as far as my fall arrest now. <coughs> what happened to the worker? Here's my back D-ring. My whole body hit the ground. All right. I didn't even fully deploy that shock pack, so if I get this thing out of the way, I, this is how this is designed. You can see kind of where that red and blue kind of come together. Basically, what keeps that energy low is it's, it's all kind of packed up nice and neat and pressed together. So as it gets to the end of that free fall, starts to unwrap like this and so basically that thing's not even fully deployed I could have you know that times two drop that down if I fully deployed that shock pack even further from the clearance requirement so that's really why there's such a trend in getting away especially in construction getting away from the, the double leg lanyards and moving in to the single leg or double leg versions like this of that back mounted self retracting lifeline. This works just like the lanyard. It gives me that mobility I need. So if I'm anchored off here, I got the 100% tie off. Before I disengage this side, I can use my free leg and go tack into my new anchor point and then come back and basically leapfrog from one anchor point to the next and remain tied off 100% of the time. And then you've got, once again, different variations from, you know, web product, into leading edge. I mean, not all products are designed for the same application. You gotta make dang sure that whatever product I'm choosing is designed specifically for the type of work that, or hazards that I could encounter, okay? So, um, we've got a lot of, of options, a lot of different hook sizes. It really just, once again, depends on what hazards you have. We've got hot work rated product, arc flash rated product, it just, there's so many diverse applications out there. We just want to make sure everybody, it's all boils down to getting home safe at the end of the day, like we were talking about inside. So, any questions? On the retractable end, is that steel cable? Or is it this is a galvanized cable, yeah. Galvanized steel. So is it coated? What this particular one is not coated. Is it conducting? This, I probably not, are you talking about for like arc flash? 
well, particularly like when they're welding on a deck. Uh, so if they're, they touch the edge of that. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's, that's conductive. The ground, the edge of the ground usually to the deck. Now we do have some hot work ready <laughs> product. So for welder. <laughs> such what we consider hot work yeah so this is good for you know fr protection where this one is arc flash there was a new standard that went into effect august 1st mm -hmm. uh, or excuse me april 1 of 2016 i believe it was that if you're in an arc flash situation you have to have product labeled an astm f887-11 and that would basically when we develop an arc flash product we we develop it we send it off to a third party where they, they nuke it with a 40 cal arc flash blast and then it has to come back and pass all the fall protection. Uh, this couldn't be used for leading edge sharp edge. That one is not designed for leading edge sharp edge, no. So I would have I don't know if that's conductive or not off the top of my head. That's something I can uh, get your so information. What, there was an accident where what they'd done is they'd, they'd used aramid fiber. Of course, if you get a nick in it, like you're dragging across the deck. Oh, yeah. So the guy fell. Yeah, so <coughs> the reason they changed the air is because the cables conduct even when the wells spot up into the deck. Yeah. <coughs> Are they anchored at the uh, at the floor as well? Uh huh. What's that retract? Okay. There's any way to elevate that? That I mean, this is that. Yeah. Foot level tie off is, I mean, it's a very application specific, and I'm not suggesting everybody transfers over to a nano lock edge because it's it's heavy. But I mean, if you don't have that that anchorage, you don't really have a whole lot of options. So, if there's any way that those that particular application, we could figure out a way to elevate an anchor point, maybe setting up a horizontal system that you know. We still have to worry about contact. Let me do some investigating on if that's conductive or non-conductive, and I can give you one of my cards, and we can communicate back and forth on that if you'd like. Nice thing would be to have one. That's a good idea. In 2016, according to OSHA's website, there's an 80% increase of individuals getting crushed to death against overhead obstacles and aerial platforms. So we developed a contact alarm and now that's standard equipment on all of our booms. And as long as the operator, if they come, what happens typically is they'll come up underneath an obstacle, it'll push them into the controls and they panic and they don't take their foot off the foot switch. So now when an operator gets pushed into, we have actually two devices on this machine. The, the roll bar is our operator protective structure, that's an option. Uh, and that is just a physical barrier that does not allow the operator to come up underneath something. But in some cases, that's not going to be useful because it's going to stop them from getting to where they need to go, right? So the contact alarm, if they get pressed into that, the contact alarm is held on by a magnet. And it pops off. And as soon as it pops off, the machine motion stops. There are LED lights that flash, and there's an alarm that sounds down at the base of the machine. That allows the operator to stop and regroup. They have this free zone here. the engine back up and then lower the machine down to safety. So if they accidentally bump into it and it pops off, they just pop it back on and, and continue their way. So that's that, that's the most effective system in the market today. It doesn't obstruct your, your view of the controls. Uh, it's not in the way of the operator uh, and it's in a nice location where you're not constantly knocking it off. 
Uh, then on the front of the machine, we have what's called our follow rest bar. And this allows an operator to get out of the machine, tie on a single lanyard point with a six foot shock absorbing lanyard, and it follows the operator around the platform. So if they're doing work outside of the machine, they can tie off to that and they can work 360 degrees around the platform and allow that lanyard attachment point to move with them. And you can get eight foot versions that you see here. You get a six foot version. It just mounts on with grade eight bolts and you can take it off of one machine and put it on another. You just have to use new bolts because you have to torque them down every time you use them. So you can move them from machine to machine. So we're really excited about that. Um, on this machine here, you see what we have, the man lift engineering shoe. And this device is designed to allow the operators to be able to squirt their bodies up into tight, confined spaces. Uh, as you saw in that picture, that individual standing on the top rail to get up in there, that's the leading cause of fatality on these machines. This allows the operator to safely step up. The mid rail on a center lift is 18 inches. This actually gives you 20 inches of additional height. And then they can step up into uh, the, the tight, confined space. This top rail becomes obstructive if it's in the way. You can actually drop that down to the same height as the mid rail and then use this built in landing attachment point on here so you can work fall protection. There's a pressure switch on the floor that senses that the operator is standing in the platform. And there's a limit switch here that will sense that the platform guardrails are lowered. So if they're in the platform and those rails are lowered, the drive function will be disabled. That way an operator can't actually move the machine while somebody's up in that confined space, right? Um, if the platform rails are fully up, then you can still drive the machine even when someone's standing inside this platform. So uh, we're constantly looking for ways. Uh, we're listening to guys like you all the time. What's the biggest challenge? What, what, what's causing the injuries out there? What's causing the fatalities? Um, and my, my stance has always been training is always the number one always a number one. We, we call these devices secondary guarding devices. And people say, well, what's your primary guarding device? It's training, right? It's knowledge, it's education, and knowing how to operate that piece of equipment. So these devices are secondary guarding devices to allow operators to do the work that they need to do, but do it more safely and more you know, productively. So we're constantly listening to input from the field, end users, job sites, uh, and finding out what, what can we build next? What can we do next that's gonna make your job safer? And uh, we appreciate opportunities to come out and do these types of uh, presentations because then we get to reach more people like you, you know, to get that word out. Yeah. Well, I think it's educational because we don't know what all the new innovations are. So we have to learn what the newest thing is. We'll be coming out with more throughout the year as well. Thank you again for the opportunity. I appreciate it. There are a lot of changes to the ANSI standards that are coming. Uh, now, we just got word yesterday that the ANSI standards have slid out again, and now it's looking more like September before the, the, the change is published. But there's going to be